Hello everyone, my name is Arvin Bhoj. Welcome to this video on Kubernetes Cluster API. It is one of the hot topics right now, and I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions about it. So hopefully we can address some of these in this video and help you build a good Cluster API foundation. In this video, we'll talk about what is Cluster API, also known as CAPI. What is the advantage of using CAPI over other Kubernetes deployment methods? What are the major CAPI components and how you could start leveraging the power of CAPI today? Please note that this is an advanced topic. So as a prerequisite, you should be familiar with Kubernetes and preferably have a basic understanding of building Kubernetes clusters using QADM. Before we get started, here's a little bit about me. I'm a principal architect global services at Data2IQ, the company that brings you DKP the number one independent Kubernetes platform in the world. My area of expertise is Kubernetes and the CNCF ecosystem. And I have around 20 years of experience in the IT industry, mainly focused on IT infrastructure management, automation, and orchestration. With that, let's move on to the more interesting part of this video. So what is Cluster API? Simply put, it's a declarative API that simplifies and automates the lifecycle management of Kubernetes clusters. This includes not just configuring a Kubernetes cluster, but also provisioning and managing the infrastructure. Yes, that's right. It takes managing the infrastructure, cluster configuration, and deploying workload, and bundles it into one single powerful component. So we don't have to rely on multiple disconnected tools to do this. Sounds like a dream come true, right? Well, it is. CAPI leverages the well-known custom resource definitions and controller model to make Kubernetes cluster lifecycle management a first-class Kubernetes citizen. It enables you to create reusable declarative templates of your cluster specifications and also stores currently deployed specs and its current state. And in most cases, allows you to update the cluster by just making changes to the existing specs, thus simplifying the process of building and managing multiple clusters, and also storing their specifications. We'll take a closer look at how it handles this later in the presentation. We have been successfully using this controller CRD model to orchestrate everything else in Kubernetes. Then why not use this simple, powerful mechanism to manage the cluster itself? Makes total sense, right? Okay, that sounds great, but why should we use cluster API if the current method is working well for us? Well, there are hundreds of different Kubernetes distributions and installers out there, each with different methods of building the infrastructure and different Kubernetes configurations, resulting in inconsistent behaviors, vendor lock-ins, and maintenance nightmares. With the tremendous momentum Kubernetes adoption has gained and the number of infrastructure provider it runs on today, the Kubernetes special interest group named Cluster Lifecycle started an initiative to tackle the complexity that organizations were running into. The solution was to build CAPI to standardize the process of building Kubernetes clusters across various infrastructure providers to produce consistent and reliable results, irrespective of the infrastructure provider being used. Just like components like CSI and CNI standardize the storage and network interfaces across different providers, the CAPI community is very active and continuously adding new features and support for more infrastructure providers, allowing you to keep up with the pace of rapidly changing technology landscape. So you can focus more on your applications and workloads rather than worrying and being left behind on an obsolete platform. Also, unlike a traditional deployment method that uses an automation tool to provision the infrastructure, CAPI uses a control loop in the form of controllers to actively monitor the deployed workload clusters that reconciles any drifts and ensures that the current state matches the declared spec. In addition to this, it makes it really easy to perform maintenance and do things like cluster auto-scaling. If you need to replace a node, simply update the Kubernetes custom resource associated with it, and you're done. Simple, isn't it? If these challenges and requirements sound like your challenges and requirements, then CAPI is the tool for you. Now that we understand what is CAPI and why we should be using it, 
let's talk about the major components that bring it to life. CAPI requires a working kubectl accessible Kubernetes cluster to host the CRDs and the controllers. Hence, a typical CAPI architecture consists of a management Kubernetes cluster where the CAPI components reside and one or more workload clusters that are deployed using it. To get started, this management cluster could be any lightweight Kubernetes cluster, even something running on your desktop, like a kind cluster, or an existing Kubernetes cluster in your environment. Once the CAPI components are deployed to the management cluster, you simply pass the infrastructure specs in the form of CAPI CRDs provided, and the CAPI controllers will take care of the rest. Now let's take a closer look at the controllers and the CRDs, starting with the controllers. The main controllers used by CAPI fall into the categories of core, bootstrap providers, infrastructure providers, and control plane providers. The last three providers are completely replaceable. The core providers are responsible for setting owner references, cleaning up objects, changing state of resources, and setting other references like bootstrap config in machine resources. Some of the controllers in this category are cluster, machine, machine set, machine deployment, etc. The bootstrap provider handles the bootstrapping process of the cluster. The default bootstrap provider is cluster API bootstrap provider kubeadm, commonly known as CAPPK. And as the name suggests, it uses kubeadm to perform cluster bootstrapping. This is responsible for generating the bootstrap data and creating kubeadm config resources for each machine with that data. The infrastructure provider is responsible for spinning up the resources, such as virtual machines and networking, in the given infrastructure where a Kubernetes cluster is to be deployed. Each infrastructure type has its own provider that knows how to interact with the respective infrastructure's interface to provision what is requested. Although there are many infrastructure providers available in CAPI today, the most popular infrastructure providers are AWS, Azure, GCP, and VMware. Lastly, the control plane provider is responsible for instantiating the control plane. Together, these controllers orchestrate the lifecycle of one or more Kubernetes workload clusters. Now let's take a closer look at the CAPI custom resource definitions. Creating and configuring custom resources based on these CRDs is the part you'll be dealing with the most, as these form the input to the CAPI orchestration to successfully deploy and manage a cluster. There are a bunch of custom resources that CAPI uses, and each one of them has a ton of parameters. So this might seem a little overwhelming when you see it for the first time, but they are not really that complicated when you understand the flow of things. Because in the end, all we are doing is using these custom resources as templates to provide the specs for the infrastructure and the specs for the Kubernetes cluster, thus making Kubernetes cluster lifecycle scalable and easy to manage. I put together a simple diagram to hopefully make it easy to understand how all of this fits together and what configuration goes where. Please note that I have intentionally omitted some of the information to make this palatable. All right then, so let's dive right into it. CAPI resources can be divided into the categories of cluster, control plane, worker node, and workload. Cluster CRDs define the overall specs. These include cluster and provider cluster resources. The cluster resource defines things like the name of the cluster, the seeders for pod and services. It also contains references to the infrastructure spec and a reference to the QADM control plane spec respectively. The provider cluster resource name depends on the infrastructure provider being used. For example, for AWS, it is called AWS cluster. For Azure, it's called Azure cluster, and so on. This resource contains the information or specs for configurations like load balancers, VPCs, subnets, security groups, rules, regions, etc. The provider specific controller watches this resource 
and handle standing of the core virtual infrastructure declared here. We will cover QVDM control train resource reference in the cluster resource in the next section. The control plane CRDs include Cube ADM control plane resource and the provider machine template resource. Like the provider cluster resource, the name of the resource depends on the provider. So if your provider is AWS, this resource will be called AWS machine template. If it's Azure, then it will be called Azure machine template and so on. The QADM control plane resource defines the QADM config spec for bootstrapping the control plane and a reference to the machine template that is used to spin up the control plane nodes using a reference provider machine template. It also defines the number of control plane nodes that should be created and the rollout strategy that is to be used just like we have a rollout strategy in a standard Kubernetes deployment. The controllers create a machine resource for control plane nodes based on the replica count set here. The QVDM config section includes cluster configuration for core components like API server, controller manager, etcd, and scheduler. In addition to this, it has a subsection that allows you to create files on the target nodes and run commands before kubeadm init and join are run. It also contains the init configuration and the join configuration that are used in conjunction with the cluster configuration to form the kubeadm config resource that works as the input for kubeadm init and join respectively. The provider machine template contains the template used to create provider machine resources. As mentioned earlier, the replicas spec defines how many provider machine resources are to be created based on this template. This defines specs like instance profile, image, instance type, subnet, etc., to form the specs of the virtual machine to be provisioned by the respective infrastructure. The fields of this template vary based on the provider and the name of the resource definition also depends on the provider. For example, AWS machine template and AWS machine for AWS, Azure machine template and Azure machine for Azure. Similarly, keeping the same theme of specifying cluster configuration and infrastructure spec, the worker node CRDs define kubeadm config template and the machine deployment resources. Machine deployment is the parent resource for the worker nodes and it contains specs like the number of worker nodes replicas to be created, the rollout strategy to be used, and a reference to the QADM config template and a reference to the provider's infrastructure ref. It is very similar to a standard Kubernetes deployment except it is responsible for spinning worker nodes and configuring them instead of spinning up pods. The core controllers watch machine deployment resources and create machine set resources and machine resources based on the number of replicas specified here. The machine set resource then ensures that the currently deployed machine resources matches the specified replicas. The referenced provider machine template contains the specs for provisioning or spinning up the machines. One provider machine resource is created per machine resource. Like the control plane resources, the name and specs of these resource definitions depend on the provider. For example, AWS machine template and AWS machine for AWS, Azure machine template and Azure machine for Azure. The kubeadm config template is used by the kubeadm controller to form the kubeadm config for the worker nodes. This is very similar to the kubeadm config spec defined in the kubeadm control plane resource, except it does not contain the cluster information and init sections, which are only required by the control. Finally, the workload category. This currently has the cluster resource set CRD that lets you push workload resources to the target Kubernetes cluster via config map or secrets. 
simply define the cluster resource set resource with the reference to a secret or a config map that contains the body of the Kubernetes manifest to be applied to the cluster. And that's it. Cappy will deploy the resources to the cluster after the core Kubernetes cluster is up. This is extremely useful for deploying core platform workloads to your cluster. So let's recap the different CRDs that we walked through right now. To define the cluster infrastructure and configuration, you need to create a few resources in the management cluster that is running Cappy. You first define the cluster resource and cluster provider resource to specify the layout of the overall cluster. Then you define the QADM control plane and the provider machine template resources to specify the configuration and infrastructure of the control plane nodes. Then you define the machine deployment resources or resource, the QADM config template resource, and the provider machine template resource to specify the configuration and infrastructure spec of the worker nodes. And then finally, you optionally create the cluster resource set resource along with the corresponding config map and secret resource that contain the manifest of the workload to be deployed to the cluster once that is up and running. That's it. Hopefully, this made it easy for you to understand Cappy and the different components. Now that you know how amazing Cappy is and how it can solve your Kubernetes cluster lifecycle related problems, I'm sure you want to kick the tires and see it in action for yourself. You can start by looking at the quick start guide in the official Cappy documentation and then follow along to take care of the prerequisites, download the cluster CTL tool, which is the CLI for directly performing Cappy operations, and follow the steps to build your first Kubernetes cluster using Cappy. This could, however, be tricky as there are various parameters you can set as we briefly saw in the last section of this video. But if you want to make progress quickly, you can contact sales at d2iq.com and get your account set up to download the DKP CLI that abstracts you from the complexities of these custom resource specs. Right off the bat, the DKP CLI lets you generate the CAPI resources for the given provider that work for 80% of the scenarios following best practices for each and also gives you flags to override many of these parameters. For deploying the Kubernetes clusters, it gives you the option to create a new bootstrap kind cluster or deploys CAPI components on an existing Kubernetes cluster. You can then simply apply the generated manifest to this cluster to spin up one or more Kubernetes clusters using CAPI, followed by deploying add-on components for monitoring, logging, authentication, continuous delivery, etc that give you fully supported production ready Kubernetes clusters that are ready for onboarding users and running workloads. Well, that's it for this video. We hope this was helpful in building your foundational CAPI knowledge and paved a way to move forward for you to start using it successfully. Please watch our videos with demos on how to deploy Kubernetes clusters on various infrastructure providers using CAPI and the DKP CLI. We look forward to working closely with you to make you successful in your Kubernetes journey. Thank you.